Okay, everyone. Uh, good morning. Welcome to MedGenome's webinar series. Today's webinar is titled A Scalable and Flexible Framework for Analyzing Large-Scale Genomic Data. Uh, my name is Derek Vargas. I'm the Manager of Sequencing Operations at MedGenome, and I'll be the host for today's session. Uh, today's webinar will run for approximately one hour, including a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the questions box and we'll do our best to answer them for you at the end of the seminar. Please also note that today's webinar will be recorded and you'll be able to uh, get a link to the webinar after the event. Uh, now I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Kushal Suryamalan. Uh, Dr. Kushal Suryamalan is a bioinformatics scientist at MedGenome and leads the commercial bioinformatics services team. He's been with MedGenome for the past two years and has helped to oversee the optimization and development of pipelines for NGS data analysis. Uh, Kushal holds a PhD in biochemistry and a master's degree in computer science from the University at Buffalo. Uh, he completed a postdoc at Genentech, uh, where he contributed to several key research projects related to cancer genomics, human genetics, and diseases. Uh, he also led multiple genome assembly and annotation projects. Uh, over the years, his work has led to multiple publications in high-impact journals, including Nature, Nature Genetics, and Developmental Biology. Um, with that said, I'd like to turn it over to Kushal. Thanks, Derek, for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. It's, it's great to see a pretty big audience here, uh, so we're excited to um, go through this webinar today. And I'm mostly going to keep it to a bird's eye view of you know, what genomics can, can deliver for research, bio, research uh, life science researchers and how bioinformatics plays a, a critical role in, in enabling uh, everyday scientists to, to get the most out of their data, especially in this era of high throughput, uh, large volume data science. Uh, um, so the title for today's talk is, is a scalable and flexible framework for analyzing large scale genomic data. Uh, essentially, uh, I'll talk to you about, you know, uh, a brief history of genome sequencing and, and how it's sort of evolved over the past two decades uh, since uh, basically the inception of the Human Genome Project and the successful completion of the human genome and uh, how the applications of genome sequencing has sort of uh, evolved in the last few decades since this uh, project and how bioinformatics plays a key role in, in genomics-based research and the applications um, that are spanned out of this innovation in uh, bioinformatics. And then highlight some of MedGenome's own bioinformatic capabilities and walk you through a few case studies uh, that highlight uh, several applications of genomics and how we've leveraged um, our capabilities in-house to uh, produce some really high quality science. I'm sure all of you are aware that nearly all cells in living organisms contain DNA. The genome, which is this collection of all chromosomes in an organism, uh, essentially encodes the blueprint of life that allows a single cell uh, fertilized egg uh, to develop into a multicellular organism. And this is true across uh, kingdoms, plant and animal kingdom, and actually is true for pretty much all of the tree of life. Um, and so how does the DNA, which includes the blueprint of life, sort of faithfully reproduce uh, multicellular organisms across generations, right? Uh, so the genome truly holds the, the keys to many of the biological questions that everyday researchers try to address. Uh, and the human genome was really that first sort of watershed moment in genomics. It was the first high quality mammalian genome assembly. And it made a big splash when the project was completed as, as shown here. And I'm just, I'm just showing you a clip, clip out of the New York Times front page, which really celebrated this momentous occasion when the human genome was sequenced. Uh, it resulted in, in a number of high impact publications. Uh, but what it took was pretty much an army of, uh, at the time, you know, relatively low throughput sequencing machines, these uh, ABI sequences. Uh, that used primarily uh, Sanger sequencing technology. So it took more than 20 years, um, about $3 billion of investment, and the rest, as they say, is history. Now, sequencing technology over the last two decades or so, since this project has, has really evolved, uh, improvements in available sequencing technologies now allow researchers to sequence the genomes of thousands 
uh, of life forms on, on pretty much the earth with projects like the vertebrate genomes project, the 10,000 genomes project, um, and so on. Uh, we've sort of seen this evolution in, in sequencing technology from the original Sanger sequencing technology first uh, invented in the 70s, which was relatively low throughput, but high accuracy uh, and had a fixed sort of sequencing length. The second generation, which all of us are familiar with, spearheaded by Illumina sequencing, um, has enabled uh, sequencing of millions of short DNA fragments, uh, making it not only high throughput, but also affordable, but is limited by the size or the, the, the length of these sequencing reads. In the last decade or so, we've seen this new technology evolve uh, mainly from back biosciences, specific biosciences and Oxford nanopore technologies, which now allow the sequencing of single molecules in real time uh, in an amplification free manner. And despite its lower accuracy, uh, these technologies often produce leads that are in the tens to hundreds of KB in length. Uh, and we call this long read sequencing technology. And, and so you, you can see the gradual evolution uh, and, and we've come to this point now where we have the ability to sequence single molecules of DNA in a high throughput manner as well. Um, and this has uh, sort of, you know, been so popular and the ubiquitous nature now of genomics and life sciences has led to a whole host of technologies developed that now enable us to interrogate various aspects of cell biology, right? Not just at the level of uh, you know a single cell but also uh, within a cell there are different components like the rna the epigenome the dna and so we see now a wide range of applications in genomics including metagenomics which allows microbiome analysis uh, transcriptomics in itself is, is a discipline which includes genome-wide expression analysis single cell transcriptomics uh, studying the immune profile uh, of cells non-coding rnas uh, and studying the epigenome, which basically regulates the genome. You look at protein DNA interactions like ChIP-seq, uh, ITAC-seq, you look at open chromatin, and of course, whole genome sequencing, which, which includes uh, exome sequencing, cap-targeted sequencing, uh, genome assembly, and annotation. Uh, genomics is also now increasingly being applied in the clinical space, and, and there are a number of applications in genomics in the clinical space as well, including uh, pharmacogenomics, looking at uh, pharmacogenomic markers and understanding how uh, drug metabolizing genes can respond to certain drugs and depending on the genetic profile, uh, does a drug respond adversely or not. You can look at uh, genetic mutation profiles of patients and that can help you stratify uh, patients and, and uh, prescribe specific therapies, which is now what we uh, call the personalized medicine era of genomics. And there are a number of other sort of uh, applications of genomic data. Uh, suffice it to say that genomics is an integral part of biomedical research. And now in the last few years, we've all witnessed this, this new era of genomics, which is basically the ability to study uh, cells at a single cell resolution. Uh, up until recently, you know, we scientists have typically explored cells in bulk uh, we know that the human body is, is composed of nearly 40 trillion cells and, and over 200 different cell types. And, and due to technical limitations in, in terms of the amount of RNA or DNA that can be extracted for sequencing, um, studying single cells was not really possible. But now it is with, with the advent of single cells genomics from companies such as 10X and Takara, um, we can now uh, deconvolute the heterogeneity in a cell and, and be able to ask questions about the gene expression uh, profiles of individual cells. And so the application of single cell genomics now goes beyond just you know, extracting uh, information from individual cells and comparing uh, gene expression profiles between cells in a tissue type of interest. Uh, we now know that you know, single cell genomics can be used in uh, not just studying the heterogeneity of tissues, but also can be used in lineage tracing study how does, for instance, hematopoiesis happen? What are the different cell types and how do they differentiate? We can also look at uh, cell population dynamics. And, and all of this is now being used in a number of applications such as in oncology, immunology, development, and neurobiology, just to name a few. Obviously, as one can imagine with all of these technologies, the amount of data that is being produced is staggering. 
you go back to the human genome project, you know, roughly about 240 machines and two to three years of sequencing produced a single human genome, um, you know, of high quality. That's a 53 gigabases. Uh, fast forward to today, a single NovaSeq, uh, which is the workhorse of Illumina today, can produce roughly six terabytes of sequence data in a week. Uh, you know, that is roughly about 48 human genomes, uh, each genome being covered at least 30 times by the sequencing data. This is just one machine. As you can imagine, there are hundreds of such machines and large sequencing cores all over the world. And so the, the challenge now becomes, how do you handle and interpret such large amounts of data? How do you process some of this data to, to, to derive any meaningful insight. And, and this is further compounded by the fact that the cost of genome sequencing has, has drastically reduced. It doesn't even follow Moore's law. I'm sure all of you have seen this slide before, right? The cost of genome sequencing has decreased. And in parallel, the number of genomes being sequenced um, has exponentially increased and it continues to rise. This is just a snapshot from GenBank, which shows the cumulative number of genomes that have been sequenced across different grades in the last few years and sort of the projection in the next five years. So it's already over uh, 150,000 genomes combined. Uh, and with projects like the Genome Tree of Life, it's, it's going to be a lot more in the next few years. Uh, and, and consequently, the amount of data that's been generated each year has been growing steadily, and if not steadily, uh, sort of linearly or exponentially. Uh, already in 2020, we have over 40 petabytes of publicly accessible genomic data, not to mention all the consortia and their private databases. Uh, and so, you know, this, this sort of reminds me of this uh, newspaper uh, article where, you know, when the Human Genome Project was first published, it was akin to a, a billion piece puzzle. And the, the goal was to put together these pieces, right? So the, the question again comes back to my um, uh, ability to handle such large amounts of data. And so bioinformatics is this one key discipline uh, that is aimed at enabling basic science drug discovery and precision medicine by extracting value from such vast amounts of uh, sequence data produced. So what is bioinformatics? Bioinformatics is this interdisciplinary field that spans a number of disciplines, uh, including computer science, statistics, hardware engineering, and biology. And the advances in each of these technologies uh, uh, in these fields, including biology, has now made it possible to analyze you know, thousands to hundreds of thousands of genomic data sets. Um, and another key component of bioinformatics, which people often you know, disregard is, is the ability uh, to not just crunch the amount of data that's been generated, but also the ability to share and maintain the underlying algorithms and the code that, that really uh, enables this analysis, but also uh, the tools that have been developed for effective visualization, interpretation, and sharing all of this information across uh, life science researchers is, is critical. And so bioinformatics uh, is easily one of the most integral parts of uh, today's biology uh, biology research and it's and it's important for realizing value out of any biological experiment beginning with experimental design all the way through analysis and interpretation and sharing so what does a typical uh, next generation sequencing assay uh, look like and how does bioinformatics play a key role in in these assays so let's as you already know most genomic sequencing assays begin with extracting uh, genetic material, DNA or RNA, um, following which there is usually an enrichment step, such as in the case of RNA, you enrich for polyadenylated mRNA. Then you prepare your sequencing libraries, and this is where bioinformatics comes in, right? Once you have sequencing libraries, what do you do with it? Uh, for instance, in a typical RNA-seq experiment, you would align the reads resulting from the sequencing libraries and sequencing experiment uh, to your genome or particular genes of interest or genetic genomic region of interest. And then you ask questions such as how many genes are expressed in say tissue A versus tissue B? What can I make out of that? Does that mean something in the context of the disease or development? And, and what you should see here, right, is a step-by-step -step sort of, you know, under the hood, what's going on uh, from a bioinformatics point of view, right? So each step, uh, includes a number of algorithms um, and are aimed at enabling this process in this workflow, starting from sequencing to pre-processing of the data to remove low-quality reads, you remove contamination, you align the reads to your genome, 
and then you count how many genes are mapping to individual genes. And then given the high throughput nature, you have to account for normalization, differences in sequencing, depths between libraries in your samples. And then there are a number of downstream algorithms and software tools that enable you to, to derive any meaningful insights out of this data. And all of these algorithms and workflows that put together these individual steps uh, truly enable parallel analysis of hundreds to thousands of samples. So that was just what this was just one application that I showed you. There are obviously numerous applications of NGS as I just showed you a few slides ago. Each requires its own workflow consisting of numerous algorithms and tools for visualization. Building, validating, and executing these pipelines requires a significant amount of expertise and time and computational resources. So what we've done at MedGenome is we've streamlined and standardized this process and we've created a platform that now allows rapid development and deployment of high-end bioinformatics pipelines. Um, each of these pipelines are rigorously tested and validated. And we've sort of created this framework for bioinformatics analysis where scientists can uh, basically uh, look at uh, a number of different NGS uh, data sets and applications uh, uh, enabled by bioinformaticians who uh, create these workflows built on Nextflow uh, and the ability to deploy uh, individual uh, genomic analyses on the cloud or locally in-house in our high-performance compute clusters. And the end user uh, typically can, can visualize high-quality uh, reports that are interactive and extensively documented. And given that they can be launched in the cloud or in, in, a, in an HPC, uh, these, um, uh, these frameworks are highly scalable and they're customizable as well. Uh, you know, changes in the code or changes in workflows or new enhancements can easily be incorporated into this framework. Uh, so what we've done is we've created this one-stop solution for uh, genomic data analysis. So uh, a bench scientist can give us his or her data and what our analysis platform does is, is munches all of these different uh, aspects of bioinformatics uh, and, and provides you know, high quality uh, reports and visualizations for uh, genomic data. As I said, we've done this now across all of the applications of NGS, including single cell genomics, which has a number of applications uh, beginning with uh, looking at gene expression profiles of individual cells, um, or looking at the, the immune repertoire, uh, be it the T cells or the B cell receptors, um, and also the ability to multiplex um, different samples and cells um, and, and bring, bring down the costs of single cell genomics as well. We've also implemented a comprehensive pipeline for transcriptome sequencing and all of the downstream applications of transcriptome sequencing, uh, including looking at tumor microenvironment uh, and, and tumor infiltration. We've implemented pipelines for whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing, targeted sequencing, uh, as well as inferring HLA uh, subtypes, um, metagenomics, uh, epigenomics, and all of the wide variety of applications in epigenomics. Uh, we've also implemented pipelines for bulk T cell and B cell sequencing and, and uh, developed uh, proprietary workflows for custom species uh, T cell and B cell receptor sequencing, which I'll get to in a couple of slides. Uh, other applications include genome assembly and annotation, um, imputation as well, uh, which, 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 will, which we'll get to in a bit, and custom analyses as well, given that the pipeline and the frameworks that we've developed uh, enable uh, a plug and play sort of system where you can bring in tools uh, that are out there and, and plug it into our analysis framework and analyze uh, data in new ways. Um, we also have a clinical diagnostics bioinformatics pipeline, um, which is CAP accredited, but it's currently available in India and South Asia. And, and this ability to plug and play sort of any workflow that's already out there or can be built by us and uh, introduced into this framework uh, allows really uh, the scalable and flexible analysis of uh, large scale genomic data. And so how does the report that I just mentioned look like, right? So typically any NGS project that's run by us uh, results in this high quality uh, report. It can be viewed by the end users. And these reports uh, are pretty comprehensive and uh, 
we will be able to look at individual tabs in these reports that show the different uh, results from our project analysis. So we have detailed QC reports that look at uh, individual uh, sampling statistics and the quality metrics that are used for downstream analysis, including gene body coverage, you know, expression across the different um, regions of the genome, such as intergenic regions, intergenic regions, exons, and so on. We also provide detailed reports on differential expression. In this case, I'm talking about RNA-seq analysis. So we have detailed tables that are easily filtered and can be searched across and can be downloaded uh, for further uh, interrogation. Uh, we have interactive volcano plots uh, that look at differential expression between samples or between uh, treatment groups. Uh, we provide high quality uh, interactive heat maps uh, that are a result of differential gene expression analyses. And we provide a pretty comprehensive pathway enrichment report uh, that looks at a number of different databases uh, such as Keg and David, and each of these plots are interactive as well. This shows just the gene network of the genes that are enriched in, you know, in, in certain pathways uh, after differential gene expression analysis. And so I've sort of quickly given you a high level overview of uh, genomics and its applications, as well as highlighting some of our capabilities and what we've done to uh, enable researchers to, to utilize genomic sequencing for their uh, research questions. Now I'll just walk you through a few case studies uh, after which you'll hopefully be able to grasp uh, the wide ranging applications and use of NGS uh, data in a number of diverse areas of research. And one of the biggest areas of genomics today is population scale genome sequencing. The, the ability to sequence hundreds to thousands of samples of genomic data um, now has the potential to provide novel insights into population specific genetic differences that can then be used for drug discovery, can inform us on rare disease studies, uh, provide insights on drug responses. And so shown here is uh, data from a pilot study that analyzed over 1,700 individuals uh, across seven global regions, uh, 64 countries uh, spanning 219 population groups in Asia. Uh, we call this the Genome Asia uh, Project, and it is the largest uh, genome sequencing study performed in Asia. Uh, so the the project involved whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing, and the integration of these data sets uh, allowed us to identify novel variants um, that can actually help in improving uh, variant filtering for the discovery of uh, disease-associated uh, genes of rare diseases. Uh, over 23% of the variants uh, introduced, uh, discovered in this study were actually not reported in existing databases. So this emphasizes the need for large-scale population genomics in understudied or undersampled uh, genetic data or uh, population demographies. Um, we also looked at the pharmacogenetic genomics uh, in these regions, right? So a lot of the drugs that have been developed have been uh, tailored, keeping in mind uh, genomes of European ancestry, but no one's really looked comprehensively uh, at you know, how do these drugs react or, or act in, in um, Asian samples or Asian uh, populations. And so what we've looked, is, looked at is the predicted adverse drug responses uh, of many commonly prescribed drugs uh, in uh, South Asian database. And we see that there are certain drugs that uh, present a, a, an adverse risk uh, when, when administered to patient, uh, people in certain populations in uh, South Asia. And so these are just some of the things that were part of the study and can highlight really how large scale population genomics uh, can, can uh, further our understanding of disease. And this paper was published in Nature uh, late in 2019. And sort of uh, uh, the data that was generated from that study really pro provided the impetus to build uh, a South Asian specific genotyping array, which we call SARGAM, or South Asian Research Genotyping Array by MedGenome. This array essentially overcomes the limitations of existing genotyping arrays that are mostly based, as I said, on data from genomes of European ancestry. And so many of the existing arrays have a significant number of genetic markers that do not exist in South Asian specific uh, samples. Uh, and so the Genome Asia 100K project and the Sargam array presents a significant improvement and, and uh, allows us to, to uh, get a better understanding of population-specific genetic differences in South Asia in a variety of diseases. 
um, shown here is the improvement in, in imputation, uh, basically uh, at lower minor allele frequencies, uh, the ability to impute uh, is drastically improved. Uh, and this is the Sargum array, and this is the, the Illumina GSA array. And uh, each uh, cell here represents a gene colored by allele counts of the uh, high impact coding variants that were uh, identified in our genome Asia sample. And so over 70% of South Asian specific genes are actually covered in our Sargum array uh, compared to the Illumina and GSA chips. So again, this is another powerful example of having uh, population specific genomic data analyzing the data, identifying variants, and then using that to actually create a valuable diagnostic uh, tool uh, for use in, in undersampled or understudied population groups. Another sort of example is, is you know, bioinformatics uh, is kind of, kind of can be used as a standalone to glean valuable insights from existing data. And the case in point here is uh, studying the relationship between naturally occurring mutants or variants in uh, ACE2, which is the key receptor that the SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, recognizes and binds to and, and uh, causes COVID-19. So the pandemic was raging in early March and uh, we leveraged our bioinformatics capabilities to analyze over 300,000 genomic sequence data sets. And we identified over 60 uh, protein coding variants in ACE2 and we validated it, uh, a handful of them that could potentially be uh, predicted to increase or decrease susceptibility to SARS-CoV-2. Many of the variants we identified actually uh, are key residues that make contact with the, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, receptor binding domain, uh, shown here in gray. And many of these variants through structure function predictions were shown to either increase um, interaction with the ACE2 receptor or decrease receptor. Uh, interaction. And that has potential implications, right? In, in therapeutics and diagnostics, you can imagine soluble forms of ACE2 containing these patients that could effectively uh, block virus um, by binding more strongly to it than the endogenous receptor and thereby preventing infection. And so this is another demonstration of utilizing bioinformatics for analysis of already existing uh, pop uh, generic publicly data uh, available databases. Another application of genomics and bioinformatics is immune profiling. Uh, genomics now enables us to evaluate the huge diversity of immune repertoire, the billions of uh, uh, sequences, either T cell receptors or B cell receptors in a more cost-effective way, either in bulk or in single cell. Uh, the ability to enrich for uh, IgGs or TCR alpha and beta chains, and then sequence them in high throughput now allows us to study, uh, you know, immune repertoire differences or responses to therapy. Uh, it helps us in antibody discovery, vaccine development, biomarker discovery, uh, immunodeficiency defici studies, and uh, as a diagnostics in, in, in the clinic as well. Uh, at MedGenome, we've developed custom proprietary assays and analyses workflows to profile the immune repertoires of not just you know, humans and mouse, but also a number of other species, including non-human primates, such as monkeys, which are important in, in drug discovery studies and uh, toxicity studies. Uh, we have provided TCR profiling services for a number of species, such as chicken, rabbit, mouse, and rat, uh, in addition to human. And our analysis pipeline provides comprehensive interactive reports that enable you to look at the immune repertoire, uh, not just in, of the T cells, but also of B cells. The single cell genomics now enables rapid discovery of thousands of antibodies using single B cell sequencing. Uh, this sort of bypasses existing hybridoma based technologies for antibody discovery, which are low throughput, are expensive, uh, thereby making this new approach more cost effective and rapid. Uh, again, here uh, at MedGenome, we've implemented workflows and, and uh, analysis pipelines for uh, profiling the B cell repertoire uh, in a number of species besides human, including horse, mouse, and rat. Our bioinformatics, <clears throat> excuse me. We've also looked at uh, the ability to, to profile the tumor microenvironment by creating uh, a sophisticated algorithm that can that is based on creating a signature of uh, 
uh, genes from eight different cell types in uh, immune cell types uh, to profile the microenvironment. Shown here is our workflow for uh, creating this uh, gene expression, minimal gene expression signature from publicly available data, uh, such as the TCGA, and uh, validation of these signatures to actually be able to confidently provide uh, immune enrichment scores for different immune cell types. Uh, and so Oncopeptium, which is our proprietary platform, is an end-to-end -end workflow to identify different immune cell types within a tumor environment. Uh, and it can be used to inform uh, therapy uh, and novel biomarker discoveries. And all of this can be included in our, uh, in our uh, sequencing uh, services as well. And the Oncopeptium results can be viewed as part of our RNA-seq analysis. So I'm just showing you a screenshot of uh, one of our tumor microenvironment analyses outputs where we provide uh, cell type specific uh, scores uh, based on different markers, uh, such as tumor inflammation, cytolytic activity, uh, T cell activation or exhaustion markers, and other uh, T cell specific markers. NGS data can also be integrated. So a number of different types of uh, data can be integrated uh, to provide more powerful insights into uh, a particular disease of interest. Uh, case in point is this integrated genomic analysis of whole genome, whole exome, RNA-seq, uh, single cell RNA-seq and TCR uh, data to, to really uh, study uh, gallbladder cancer, which was um, not very well uh, studied uh, till day, till the publication of this study in Nature Communications. And we analyzed uh, over uh, 700 patient samples uh, from gallbladder cancer, and we were able to identify uh, significantly mutated genes uh, in gallbladder cancer not previously associated with gallbladder cancer, including ELF3, uh, shown here. Uh, and we identified uh, new antigens from our new antigen prediction pipeline, which is also a proprietary uh, mid-genome algorithm. Uh, and we tested many of these new antigen variants uh, for their ability to activate CD8 T cells in uh, donor PBMCs. Uh, we also looked at uh, mutations that were uh, in genes that could be uh, therapeutically uh, targeted and we call these actionable alterations, and there are several existing drugs that can now be repurposed for treating gallbladder cancer based on these mutation profiles. Uh, and so this is another clear example of where bioinformatics and genomics can play a role in an integrated analysis of uh, lesser studied cancer types. And here, another sort of uh, application of genomics, especially in the era of long read sequencing, is the uh, de novo assembly and annotation of uh, species where there is no high quality reference genome. Unlike the human, mouse, or rat genomes where there are plenty of high, where there's a really high quality reference genome, there are many species that do not have a high quality reference genome. And uh, the ability to generate these genomes at a, a low cost uh, and in a small amount of time is now feasible because of the evolving technologies such as long read sequencing, chromosome confirmation capture, and what I'm showing you here is a high quality reference genome of the Indian cobra, which is a highly venomous snake, and the ability to identify the genes that encode components of the venom uh, is a critical step in, in discovering antibodies against these uh, venom components, and that can help in reducing the lethality that is, uh, you know, uh, the, the effect of these toxins in, in snake bite victim, victims. Uh, so, MedGenome has a comprehensive pipeline for the assembly and the annotation, that is the identification of the genes and the, uh, and the functional assignment of these genes to their known homologs. Uh, this paper was published in uh, Nature Genetics uh, early last year. In addition to all of these research services, uh, Bioinformatics also has a, uh, MedGenome has a comprehensive clinical diagnostics bioinformatics pipeline. Uh, you know, beginning with uh, sample acquisition and data management, uh, we have rigorously tested and approved bioinformatics pipelines for germline and somatic analysis. Uh, we've already analyzed more than 100,000 patient samples. Uh, we use uh, custom proprietary AI-based prioritization of the identified variants um, and genotypes for clinical reporting. So I hope I've convinced you the power of bioinformatics and genomics. Uh, and how at my genome, we've leveraged these capabilities to produce some real high quality science uh, in collaboration with academic and industry partners. 
uh, we have over a team of uh, we have a team of over 100 bioinformatics specialists, uh, including 25 PhD level scientists that are experienced in large scale data analysis, but also bring with them deep biology expertise in a number of uh, application areas such as plant and human genomics, molecular biology, immunology, uh, protein structure modeling, uh, population genetics, drug target discovery, machine learning, big analytics, uh, big data analytics, and, and many more. Uh, and we published over 200 plus original articles um, in a number of high impact journals, uh, which is really um, you know, validation of our uh, ability to, to transform genomic data into, into meaningful insights. And with that, if you are interested in, in working with us and elevating your own research uh, by using genomics and bioinformatics, uh, please feel free to contact us, uh, research at medgenome.com. Uh, <clears throat> And I thought I'd end with this slide, which was uh, a commentary on uh, the, the future of bioinformatics in 1991. Uh, you know, this person said, we must hook our individual computers into the worldwide network that gives us access to daily changes in the database and also makes immediate uh, communications with each other. The programs that display and analyze the material for us must be improved and we must learn how to use them more effectively. Like purchase kits, they will make our life easier. But also like the kids, we must understand enough of how they work to use them effectively. And so bioinformatics is still sort of the, uh, this evolving field where every day new improvements are made. And so in order to be able to stay on top of the field, uh, it's important to understand what uh, the underlying algorithms do and how they can be best used for your particular research question of interest. Uh, so it's going to be a fascinating next few years with genomics and uh, bioinformatics and the intersection of the two. Um, thank you for your time. I will take any questions now. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Kushal. That was a terrific presentation. Um, definitely a lot of good information there. Uh, we're running a bit short on time, but we do have a few questions. Um, so maybe we can answer a few now. And any questions we don't get to, we will uh, respond via email. Um, and an email address is on the screen. Um, so first, um, I had a few people asking um, if we can uh, do analysis on their own data that's generated um, out, like not generated by MedGenome. Um, yes. If we uh, send you data, are you able to do analysis on large, large cohort, cohorts? Um, and what is the typical turnaround time? Yes, so the question to the... The answer to the first question is yes, we we definitely can take data that's already been generated and um, analyze them based on your needs. Uh, the turnaround time, we our turnaround times are pretty fast, uh, depending on the, the need and the complexity of the data and the analysis that obviously uh, is subject to sort of uh, change. Um, are our pipelines available for research or education uh, purposes? And if so, what are the terms and conditions? Um, so all of the pipelines that we've developed are state of the art sort of standard um, published pipelines. And so in our documentation, the reports that I was showing you, there is extensive documentation on the algorithms, the pipelines, uh, and the parameters that we used, but obviously the integration of those pipelines is what we have done. So, you know, uh, that is the tricky step basically. So in terms of usage of those pipelines, uh, I think it's it's an internal sort of pipeline and we'd have to discuss on, on how we can make use these pipelines. And uh, maybe one last question. Um, uh, the scientist says, I'm working on a very rare, fewer than 10 known cases worldwide, uh, connective tissue disorder. Can I get access to South Asian genetic data you have for research? Um, so that is, uh, we, we can get in touch with you and, and uh, get more details on what you are interested in and, and see how we can, if, if we can make it work. But I'll have to defer that to some of my colleagues who are uh, more specifically in charge of, of the Genome Asia project. Uh, very good. So again, um, if you do have any other questions, feel free to uh, send us an email um, and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Uh, the webinar itself will be available um, 
as a recording. Uh, we will send it out um, at a later date to everybody who registered. Uh, so you could rewatch it. If more questions come to mind, just let us know. Um, but again, I'd like to thank Kushal for the presentation and I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. All right, thank you everyone.